Hello, everybody, and welcome to another geospatial webinar today sponsored by Infotech. I'm Nora Parker, uh, webinar producer at Directions, and I'll be moderating today. Behind the scenes helping me is my colleague, Lynette Qualia. So if you have any questions or technical difficulties during the webinar, ping us via the chat interface, and we should be able to help. Today, as the title suggests, we're going to learn about 3D building models, and this is a follow-on to the webinar we did with Infotech back in February, which addressed developing terrain models. So if you take those two webinars together, it's a pretty good uh, educational um, uh, unit for learning everything you need to know about uh, terrain and 3D building models. This is a pretty complicated subject. I feel like it's going to try to cover a lot of ground in one webinar, so please do stay um, uh, put your seatbelts on because we're going to be moving very quickly and I'll introduce you to everyone in more depth as we go along but right now I want to mention that Infotech is offering a free data analysis to our webinar attendees. Contact Drew Marin in the Americas and Hanuman Chadagam for ev everywhere else and if you have Autodesk questions of course please contact our, um, our um, speaker Prasad uh, Pandit from Autodesk and I'll be giving you their contact information a little bit later on and their contact information will also be included in the follow-up notes that will go up probably tomorrow. So keep that in mind the, as we're going through the session today that if you do have questions and need to ask more deep, question, deep questions about your specific situation, you'll be able to talk to our speakers about that. Um, and as I said, I'll introduce everybody as we go along, um, but I want to get started as we have a very full agenda. But before we leave this slide, I want to mention to you that if you need a certificate for today's of attendance for today's webinar. For, uh, if you're going for your GISP certification, you can use today's webinar towards your EDU3 documentation. So please drop my colleague Lynette an email after the webinar, and I'll give you her email address in just a second. Um, I'll put that in the, tra uh, in the jo uh, chat box, but I wanted to greet a lot of you have told, written in and told me where you're calling in from. So we have Seth from Somerset, New Jersey, Giselle from Cottage Country, Ontario, Nathan from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, Silvio calling from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Faizan in uh, London, Jason in Burlington County, New Jersey, Xiaopeng from Ottawa, Mary from North Attleboro, Carrie uh, uh, from California, and as you can see from the map that we have on the screen, we have people um, registered from this webinar from all over the place, so it's great to have um, such an international um, audience. So anyways, moving on, I just want to, to give you um, some housekeeping tips. We encourage you to ask questions and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible. You can also send us a tweet at Directions Mag and include the hashtag DMWebinar. I'll keep an eye on that while we're going through. And I also want to mention that Drew Marin uh, is uh, tweeting as well these days, so it's at Drew Marin, and you can um, use that as well during this webinar if you'd like. You can access a, cop a PDF copy of the slides, as well as a link to the biographies for the speakers. I'll put the URLs for those two items into the chat box in just a minute. And we'll be taking some polls during today's webinar, three to be exact, and we'll walk you through those when we get to them. And today's webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email with instructions on how to view the recording on demand. And that's also handy if you want to pass it on to your colleagues, and we'll get those out to you as quickly as we can, hopefully tomorrow. And finally, there will be a quick survey as you exit the webinar. We'd appreciate it if you take a second to just tell us how you thought we did today. And I want to say hi to a few more people who have uh, chatted in to me to tell me where they're um, dialing in from. And we have Miguel from Argentina, and John from New York, and... Um, Let's see, we have Johan calling in from Germany, Pete from Washington, D.C., Michelle from Southampton in the U.K. Great to have all of you here. So just in case you're not familiar with Directions Media and Directions Magazine, we're best known for our online publication, Directions Magazine, and for our newsletters. We also do some conferences and webinars. So please do visit us at directionsmag.com. We have uh, cool new articles up there every single day, um, lots of fun. All right, just a quick word about our um, agenda here. So you've already heard from me, and I'll be bringing on Drew Marin in just a second to talk about um, 3D structure modeling. And then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Hanuman Chadagam uh, 
talking about moving from 3D terrain to 3D infrastructure and actually getting into a little bit more of the process of building those 3D models. And then we have our special guest, Prasad Pandit, with Autodesk, who's going to be uh, talking about 3D models from Autodesk perspective, and then a little bit more on benefits and future directions, and then we'll get into your Q&A. But right now we have our first poll. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Um, and we want to know how important are 3D models in your organization. And your choice is here. Click on very important, somewhat important, not at all important, or not sure. And um, I'm going to go ahead and say hello to a few more people here while I am um, waiting for you to respond to that poll. And there will be another poll right behind this one as well. So we've got um, Richard from Joint. Base, McGuire, Dix, Lakehurst, New Jersey. I hope I said that right. And we have Mike in Palm Desert, Palm Springs, California. It's probably beautiful there today. We really appreciate that. And let's see. It looks like most of you have uh, responded on this poll. So I'm going to go ahead and close it up so we can get to our next poll. Okay. Here we go. Okay. A little flurry of voting there. I don't want to top you off. Okay. Good. I'm going to go ahead and share those results and looks like for most of the audience um, it's very important or somewhat important. 20% um, of you are not all that important or not sure. Great, we're going to go on to our next poll. We really want to know, does your organization have some form of 3D models at this point? And your choices here are no, we don't. Um, yes, we have good terrain models and or building models. Yes, but they need work. Or the uh, last choice, of course, is not sure. And in the meantime, hi, we have Kamar from Irbad, Jordan, and Tim from Victoria, BC, Canada. I was just up in on Vancouver Island a couple of weeks ago. Absolutely beautiful up in um, Victoria. Um, and of course, our audio, our speakers are very geographically. Um, distributed today as well. We have um, speakers calling in from India as well as the East Coast of the U.S. And we have um, Aziza from Lakeland, Florida, and uh, Michael from Cyrus, Cy Michael, Cyrus from Mississauga. Great to have you guys here. All right, so I'm going to um, check on our poll here. Looks like uh, most of you have voted. If you haven't voted and you'd like to get a word in on this poll, please go ahead and do so. And uh, great, I'm going to close it. And again, I'm going to share these results. So um, about 30% of you don't have uh, train or building models. Um, another 30% of you do have them. Um, almost 40% of you have them, but they need some work. And 5% of you are not sure. Great. Well, we really appreciate you participating in those polls. And that will really help Drew and Hanu and Prasad um, know what your experience level is as we go through the webinar. So I want to pass it over to Drew now. Um, he's a Geospatial Engineering Manager for Int Infotech Enterprises America, and he has over 13 years of experience in GIS, IT, and sales. And um, I'm going to go ahead and put those um, items in your chat box now that I mentioned before, so I'll go ahead and do that. But over to you now, Drew. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Nora. It's good to be here with you in Directions Magazine again. Before we get into the topic of 3D models, I wanted to give you a perspective of how we got here. Like with all things today, there is a convergence of technology, analysts, costs, and the consumer demand which drives the trend. This is no different with 3D modeling. Over the last 15, 20, possibly even 30 years, we've seen a tremendous advance in what we can produce to support the consumer. As you can see from the image above, many factors contribute to this convergence, convergence rather than one or two main drivers. As we've seen in an advance in computer processing and storage to allow for more robust and large database handling, the evolution of the gaming industry to heighten the consumer experience, and an understanding of a digital rendering of your surroundings, and a consistent expanding analytics, uh, and analytics demand. As Nora mentioned again, uh, we are offering a free analysis of any interest uh, of your parties for your uh, for your data. In our webinar back in February of this year, Infotech presented on terrain data discussion, discussing what it is, where it comes from, how it's generated, and why it's so important for making business decisions. 
With this webinar, InfoTech will educate on how a 3D model is generated from different data sources and how modeling is used today and where it is going. Every organization that requires or uses geospatial information has some form of elevation needs. An accurate elevation data set allows for a digital rendering of what is represented on the Earth's surface. A digital surface model, or DSM, does represent above ground features such as structures and vegetation, but its purpose is not to convey an accurate model of the structure. A 3D structure, as you can see in the screen, will represent how a building sits on the Earth's surface. 3D structures are developed for many purposes and for many different sources. The key takeaways for this webinar are the different data types and sources used for compilation, the compilation process of a 3D structure, and a further understanding of how 3D models are represented and visualized. 3D modeling and texturing helps in key applications for many industries like municipalities, utilities, telecom, and commercial, and markets like disaster management, urban planning, navigation, gaming, and recreation. In each of these industries and markets, there will be different requirements or more cost-effective solutions to delivering 3D models. There are four distinct types of geospatial sources that are used for generating 3D models, and I have the pictures of each one of them represented. An aerial or satellite image, oblique imagery, for those of you who don't know, is an, air, is an image captured at an angle, usually at 45 degrees, to allow for a full facade observation of all building sites. Terrestrial LIDAR, which is a LIDAR sensor taken from a vehicle or portable unit on the ground, and aerial LIDAR. Each industry may need one or more, one or more multiple data sources to achieve the desired results. But one main driver for everyone is how accurate the model is needed. My colleague Hanu will be speaking about this and provide a more technical description on how 3D structure is compiled in subsequent slides. But before I hand it over to him, I wanted to give a few quick examples of what some industries are particularly using these sources for. In urban development, terrestrial LIDAR provides a detailed facade in a concrete area or corridor. For engineering and architectural, highly accurate models are needed, so a combination of all sources may be required. In conceptual model like modeling, like gaming or Earth browsers like Google Earth and Apple Maps, where accuracy is not necessarily a priority, but visualization is, aerial and oblique imagery is most commonly used. I'd like now to hand it back to you, Nora, to introduce Hanu. Great, yeah, I just love those kinds, of, those um, 3D tr um, building models. They just look so, um, I don't know, you know, they're just a lot of pretty pictures. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, we kind of a lot of us GISers are really into um, attractive imagery. You know, a lot of us really love love cartography. There's just something about those um, 3D models that just make visual visualization so um, doable. I, I really enjoy um, getting to do a webinar on that subject. But let's go ahead and hear from Dr. Hanuman Chadagam. Hanu has 16 years of uh, geospatial industry experience uh, in various business segments, and he holds a postgraduate degree in Earth Sciences and a PhD in Remote Sensing Exploration. Hanu, thanks so much for joining us today, all the way from India. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Good morning, everybody. Before we get down to the business of looking at beautiful models, buildings of course, let me first discuss on how these models are created, what process and industry follows, and what elements are involved when creating these models. Though the models look beautiful, the beauty depends on what accuracy and what details one has captured. If you look at this slide, it depicts a typical process flow which is followed to achieve different level of details. Level of details, or LOD, is a common industry term used to classify what type of 3D structures you are looking for. The LOD details varies from 1 to 4. The reason for this is there are two main drivers. It is the user requirements or the budget constraint. LOD1, which is a simple box wireframe or a solid model, which is easy to capture and develop, whereas LOD2, it's a detailed blueprint, wireframe or a solid. And likewise, LOD3, 
which is goes with the solid but with central texturing and LOD4 is a detailed roof print solid with real photo texturing. As you know most customers use a combination of these LOD models with more generic residential units which are given as LOD1 designation and more urban centers give LOD2 or LOD3 with a few landmark or marquee structures and those requires more details and finer details go for LOD4. The key element in this is the source data. The right source for the right purpose will give the required detail level. If you see the process depicted here in this slide, it typically starts with a source image compilation for building roof lines and followed by a geometric construction of the footprints. While this activity is going on, we have to get the source photographs made ready for texturing. Then both the geometric model and the cleanser photos will get merged together to develop a texture 3D building model. Then using various technologies such as Autodesk InfraWorks, we can definitely develop a beautiful city models and export them to any required formats that one needed. Now let's see to visualize the process uh, that I've just spoken on, let's see an example how a building can be modeled. The prerequisite for any 3D photometric process is to have a significant overlap which undergoes the error triangulation process. Error triangulation, what we call AT, is a process which one can eliminate the parallax and orient the models to a real world coordinates. With a full image coverage, a complete line network of buildings will be captured using stereo techniques and the entire structure will be well represented. As you see here, it's a completely represented the, uh, the pink lines that you can see here. The compiled vector files are rendered using CAD overlay such as MicroStation or AutoCAD following which a, a 3D wireframe for the building would be generated using trifaces. Once uh, the such solids are developed and the faces are ready, each face is identified and the aerial photographs will undergo georeferencing using a semi-automated approach to texture onto the facades of the solid model. Once such models are uh, created and textured, they are then grouped in a common database. Generally this allows for a, a complete rendering of your project extent like you see in this slide where they are falling on a viewer. The final texture model are checked for the right coordinates in these spatial viewers for necessary confirmation. Once referenced, this data set can be sent into any Earth browser such as R Globe or AutoCAD or uh, Google Earth. In this slide, you can see we are showing the texture of uh, the Las Vegas Strip. There are a variety of tools and processes which can be used to execute this process which results in a clean model. In this particular flow, the polygon model is overlaid with 3D texture map and then follows a step-by-step -step approach to achieve a final raster image for texturing. Nowadays, every camera that has a high resolution sensors can snap the buildings. Almost anybody can take this picture including my dear colleague Drew Maron who took these pictures what you see on this slide. Yeah, he's such a However, weird. one nice cannot job, overcome Drew. the obstruction. Yeah. They cannot, we cannot overcome the obstructions sir, because they are very much required to be clean and they come across all these photographs and this is always a challenge. Though it does not look like a significant problem but we have seen this place a vital role in the process of real photo texturing. You can see in this slide there is a car parked in front of the building and you see the adjacent snap the car has been eliminated but the beauty here is ensuring the texture, the detail and the property of the photograph is retained. That gives you the detail of a model. Similarly, there can be poles or I mean the utilities or any obstructions, the views which needs to be removed. So we have to use image editing techniques to clean the image before it goes for the final texturing. 
real photo texturing in a spatial context is one of the key process that one should be able to precisely match to the exact measurement of the real building. Each piece of this photograph is what you see in this slide, which is clean and described as described in my previous slide, it has a different characteristics. So each picture will now undergo an image editing process and are rendered for proper texturing. The technique and the skill set, what we all believe, adds the value for perfect texture model in this particular case. Now, let's see uh, what I'll explain, let's see a sequence of how the whole modeling process follows, which is a solid model and then followed by a wireframe and you can see then overlay onto the Google and then you can see a beautiful total terrain model. And then you can, uh, yes, there you can see it. So now you can have a beautiful picture of that solid model, then it's your reference and perfectly fine. Similarly, the same process is followed even for synthetic texturing with some selected designs based on the building location or a, a customer requirement. Synthetic textures can be more productive and produce much faster because they can run an automated process for all the wild frame solids that we create as explained in my previous slides. During 3D models and modeling development, there will be many challenges and many minor issues that can raise which cannot be eliminated automatically or even properly processed using native applications. At Infotech, we have developed various in-house tools over years to assist in resolving common issues uh, as you all know such as like creating walls or image corrections or sensory texture. These are all easy to, easy to use but they are very important that they need a lot of techniques and to have a more pro productive in environment. These tools not only give the right quality but also prove to be very useful for our product improvements. There are many evolving technologies in today's workplace, but almost all of them use the core type of processing that have been spoken about. Now, let's see how the emerging technologies drive towards creating city models and develop some interior designs. Thank you all and I now pass it on to Nora. Thank you very much, Hanu. And now we're going to hear from Prasad um, Pandit, and he is a technical evangelist with a civil engineering background. He has 16 years of experience in geospatial infrastructure building industry, and he's been with Autodesk for the last 10 years. And Prasad, I'm going to pass it over to you for your presentation. And thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for, um, I mean, bringing me in. Uh, thanks to Infotech and Directions Magazine and anchoring uh, this to, especially to Nora. All right, folks. So uh, I must say half uh, the world, the good morning, and half the world probably the evening. And uh, let's enjoy what uh, we are going to look at it. So when we look at um, the 3D models, what uh, Hanu showed right now, so it's, it's more of creating the 3D world and how it is going to be benefited to us is a different scenario. But when we look at it, how, let's, let's see how it has been built. So most of the time, if you look at it, most of the architect, most of the designers, they use more, uh, these kind of technologies like Revit, AutoCAD, or 3D modeling applications, where typically we create the exteriors out of it. But today, we also have a technology where we can bring in the data which we can scan the room from the inside where we can scan in point clouds and we can bring in these kind of point clouds inside and we can view it in a much effective way than just creating and you know uh, spending a lot of time on the 3D models where we can just scan the room get the 3D model and start working in it so this is a small idea about how we can scan the interiors what about the exterior part when we look at the exterior thing, so we, we always believed in a lot of technologies where, you know, the satellite survey and aerial survey, but we have a very easy way to get it. Get any camera, shoot the picture with 5 degrees and 10 degrees spacing in between, get the 360 view, create the 3D model, 
and push the 3D model to create the specific asset into our this technology. Let's have a look at it, how uh, it actually works. So you can look at on your left side, which is Canon S100, which is a normal uh, photo, uh, I mean the kind of camera, which is which we use most of the times to take family photos and all. And you can see a kind of a toy down below, which is DJI NASA uh, 550, which is a kind of a hexacopter. You can fix the camera, fly it on the top of your building, get the snaps, and process the snaps in a specific way on the cloud, which it's more of, you know, it creates the automatically the 3D building and it gives you uh, on your desktop. So it's a cloud-based technology, Recap Photo, which comes along with most of the all subscription uh, advantage of all the Autodesk technologies. And it's a free tool. We suggest you to go and use it. We have one more tool called Recap, um, uh, typically to show the point clouds and all, but Recap and Recap Photo, both you can create a nice 3D models like this. When we look at these technologies, we can get the inputs or give the inputs into the kind of technologies or the platforms available today. So it's AutoCAD, Navisworks, uh, Revit, Inventor, InfraWorks, Civil 3D, Map 3D, Plan 3D. So it's more of the whole uh, kind of uh, uh, disciplines we cater in. And the recap engine really works classical to produce kind of beautiful buildings in this. So let's look at the workflow, how it exactly goes on. So if you look at it on your light, uh, left side, which is uh, a kind of a scanner which scans the interior and exterior, and it produces the kind of buildings like this. Similarly, you can take the, you know, uh, the kind of hexacopter on top, and you can get this uh, data from the top, where you have the point cloud and you have the photography together. And you can push the data into either Maya, which is an animation application, or 3ds Max, with, with the kind of extensions like FBX, OBJ, and you can even combine these two workflows together and get a beautiful model like this. Let's look at what we can do with a uh, beautiful model like this. So you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, kind of model the entire uh, building in internally, and you can use the point cloud for your normal walls and doors. So you can just draw. Right now, I'm drawing a kind of a wall here, and I will uh, put in one kind of a door. So. I can place it anywhere. So this is Revit technology for the architects, MEP guys, HVAC, you know, if you look at the structural people and get a better view like this. So you can see the real time kind of lighting. You can get the 3D view of your pine cloud and you can get the nice wall with the door. You can see the even texture and the kind of, you know, posters, you know, pasted on the top of your um, walls. So this is a kind of a technology where we can use point cloud and the real-time walls and do the nice designing in this. Then we can get into, uh, which is exterior and interior both together, and we can pull both the kind of data sets inside your InfraWorks. InfraWorks can generate the models from geospatial or kind of a model which is uh, specifically for you know uh, kind of a georeference model or you can georeference it inside according to your uh, requirement and you can create a beautiful 3D models like this wherein you can use recap and you can reuse infraworks together to produce these kind of things and get a better view of the uh, you know the kind of infrastructure you have around with the help of the BIM data and with the help of your uh, geospatial data also it's a kind of a convergence we are talking about so once you get this, what if somebody doesn't have this technology? So you are most of the times into space management or hotel management or most of the time in, in, in types of uh, basically a kind of uh, getting the view of what exactly is there. So you have a Navisworks simulate, you Navisworks manage, which can read the type of data where you can use the recap and Navisworks manage both the applications together where it produces a beautiful 3D models like this and you can fly in, inside. So this is basically for um, most of the city engineers to view a specific data for of the town or maybe uh, HVAC or MEP or the system side people to get a better view of the what kind of systems you have. Maybe good for even uh, your city uh, people where you can get the sewer data, you can get the utilities, you can do a lot of mapping in this. All right, so in the end we will see how exactly these three things are getting together. So for example, I have a building footprint and I would like to generate the 3D city out of it. How do I do it? 
So I have a story information as an attribute which is stored inside the building footprint and I just consider that 3 meter is the height for my uh, per floor and I can generate a kind of a view height or the slope and I can generate the uh, city then and there. So this is geo GIS data, geospatial data which we are viewing 3D. It's better than you know having a look at 2D and get keep on visualizing it in, instead. You can visualize yourself, you can identify where are the uh, you know kind of amenities, where are the kind of uh, uh, buildings. For example, for an architect or a, a township uh, kind of a projects, uh, it's good to have the textures which is LOD 3, 4 or whatever. So you can bring in the models from BIM, you can bring in the models, you can get the textures, you can see the textures which is a wall which is a kind of a uh, paper, wallpaper of uh, a kind of a wooden feeling and you can get these things and walk in inside. I mean you can just walk in inside the building, outside the building, get a beautiful view of your infrastructure. So that's the whole point which I wanted to make here that we have the cutting edge technology and it's time for us to communicate the design in a right manner. So that's it from my side, folks. Thank you so much. So over to you, Nora. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to take um, it from here, uh, Prasad. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Go yeah. for it, Drew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah thank, thank you. Thank you, Prasad, and thank you, Nora, uh, for really giving a, robust, for giving a robust overview of Autodesk and the support in the 3D modeling marketplace and really showing the different levels of detail uh, in the, uh, the last example that you showed. To make sure we have a few more pretty pictures to show you, we have a <laughs> couple of quick case studies here which show uh, the scope, the source, use, and technology applied to create a complete 3D model and some examples around that. As you can see in this slide, the client, based in the New England area, opted for a complete detailed roofline 3D model with a few select images that were textured with digital images captured by the client. You will notice the inputs used and technologies applied to create these models. In addition to the 3D structures, a complete mapping project was provided with color and CIR true orthos, detailed planimetrics, and a fully compliant planimetric database. The customer timeline for the completion was roughly nine months from the date of aerial acquisition to final sign-off. A total of 70,000 total features were captured and delivered, including the 3D models along with the textures. This is just another customer located in the Middle East whose main purpose was to visualize their city on an earth browser in great detail. Aerial imagery and digital photo images were, images were supplied in order to capture and texture the entire city of some 100,000 structures, plus or minus a few. Hmm. The client had an aggressive window for completion, and this was to take advantage of the most recent structures completed within this region due to lots of development happening all the time. Uh, so this is my final slide here. We really hope you enjoyed the webinar today and now have a better understanding on how 3D models are created, the purpose for it, and utilization and how it's used today. We see the three main benefits um, for 3D stru uh, structure modeling. Serve the industry as a whole are support stakeholder approval by visualizing your data. With budget constraints all around us these days, every aspect is needed to be explained to a stakeholder. And visualization is one of the best tools in explaining your data needs and requirements. Better simulation models. For the aviation industry, both commercial and military, accurate models are needed to provide near real-time simulation. In addition, with airports becoming more and more congested, finding better and more efficient ways for the airlines and pilots to get in, out, and around the airport as fast as possible, models are a vital component for navigation. Enhance the customer user experience. The demand for providing, providing multiple ways of allowing your customer to engage with your product or service is needed more and more. The future is fast, uh, fast approaching on us. Technology and companies are constantly bringing new capabilities to support the modeling marketplace. A day will come when you can augment reality in your everyday life. Google Glass is one such product that is a major step in this becoming commonplace. Mm -hmm. With a faster process and delivery speeds, real-time data may become available to us. The concept of the world in your hands is actually here with a smartphone allowing you to access to any piece of information anywhere in the world at any given time. Thank you again, and I hand it back to you, Nora.
Great. Thanks so much, Drew. So our third poll, um, we're going to launch it here. And we want to know, from what you've learned today, do you have a better understanding of 3D modeling? And your choices here are, I've been living in a virtual world for years. <laughs> um, another choice is, yes, I have a clearer understanding. No, I still need more information. And that's fine, too. Or the last choice is, I'm not really sure. Um, and please go ahead and respond to that poll. Um, and I'm queuing up questions here as well. We've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience, but um, hopefully we can get to them all. And if you have a burning question that you have not yet um, put into the questions um, into the chat window, please go ahead and do so. And a reminder about the um, EDU3 um, uh, um, uh, points for the GISP certification. So these are the education points. and um, and if you need a certificate for that because you're either working towards getting your GISP certificate or you need to renew your GISP certificate, please do go ahead and um, send my colleague Lynette an email. And I did put her email um, address into the chat box a little while ago, so hopefully you can retrieve that from there. And let's see, how are we doing on this poll? Looks like um, about... Uh, about almost, yeah, almost all of you, almost 75% looks like have participated in this poll. And so I'm going to go ahead, if you haven't, I'm going to give you a couple seconds if you want to, yep, there goes a flurry of votes right there. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and close it up and I'm going to share the results. And you'll be glad to know that 13% of you have been living in a virtual world for years. I love that. Um, 63% of you do def have definitely learned, um, have a clear understanding about this whole um, 3D um, uh, building um, um, modeling aspect. 22% um, of you are, still need more information, and 3% of you are, um, are not quite sure where to take it from here. But that's great, because you've all gotten some new information. And the 13% of you who have been living in the virtual world for years, you probably could have given this webinar. So that's great. All right, so um, I want to go ahead and get to our questions. Um, and thanks for sending those in. And um, let's see, I'm going to start here. Um, this one, I think, goes to, uh, I think, Hanu, you'd be the best person to answer this one. This comes in from Justin. Are obliques required to assign RGB pixel values to the sides of buildings? You need to have that oblique view for that. Thanks, Nora. Yes, uh, uh, good question. Uh, yes, obliques uh, definitely would be used as one of the source. And if the obliques are textures are perfectly in line with the lines, 3D lines that are generated in vector files, and that would uh, really go in a semi-automated approach. So obliques are always have a very automatic approaches where they can go and sit directly on the sides where it can create a, a smooth structure. But okay. the challenge here is your line should match to the image texture. The edges are important here. Yes, they can be used. Okay, great. And on this slide, I wanted to mention to you that you can um, uh, find the contact information for our three speakers today. Um, and I will also include um, all of these uh, contact points in my email that I send out to you tomorrow. So you don't feel that you need to scurry and write down the emails um, or the phone numbers or in Drew's case, the Twitter handle. But um, I will send those out tomorrow. Um, so going on to some more questions here. Um, let's see. So Drew, um, this one goes out to you. Um, um, what are uh, what commercial off-the-shelf software packages can we use for 3D modeling? Uh, th there are several kinds. Um, of course, AutoCAD, uh, MicroStation, uh, Google SketchUp, um, Socket Set, Socket GXP, Esri City Engine, uh, 3D Studio Max, as well as um, all the Autodesk uh, products um, that Prasad has mentioned. Uh, there are a varying degree, cost, scale. Mm -hmm. It really does depend on what you need. But um, the technology and available software to support that technology is very read readily available today. Um, and uh, there are some also some open source platforms that are available. 
uh, to really tweak um, if you have several different softwares and need to toggle in between and showcase it uh, for visual aid. Open source platforms are also available. Okay. All right, great. Um, so this one is going to go to Prasad, I think. So do you have any productivity metrics of this for, th for the 3D modeling? Oh, yes. I mean, a uh, uh, very, very nice uh, question because, see, when we look at the 3D models, which we have been, I mean, we are, we are currently seeing, I mean, Hanu was showing, Drew was talking about, and I was showing you all the things. So it's actually not the ready-made thing. So it, it, a lot of a process you know, gets involved right from its, um, you know, uh, the kind of AutoCAD or the 2D level to go to LOT 1, 2, 3, 4. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, workflow is involved. So according to the workflow, uh, I can talk about the Autodesk initiative where we have uh, kind of workflow-based solutions which takes you right from your AutoCAD 2D data to make it into the 3D world and you know uh, make the cities like this. So in yeah. infrastructure design suite, which we have standard, premium, and ultimate three versions, so I would suggest go with the ultimate. So that's that's the whole thing is all about where you can get all these things together and make beautiful models like this. So that's it from my end. Any, anything okay. specific? Anybody want to know? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. The um uh, I guess, you know, I guess in this case it really has to do with uh, convincing management of the need for the models because the thing that's tricky about this is that, you know, obviously we're going to get some productivity gains and we're going to be able to sell the need or we're going to be able to visualize, I guess I could say, um, potential infrastructure um, updates to a city. Um, but it's it can be hard, I would imagine, to... Um, to convince management of the benefits of going into a 3D um, project. I think that was what the, where the questioner was headed with that. See, uh, it, okay, I mean, uh, if I might understand the question, I think uh, it is being difficult for uh, convincing the management for getting into 3D model. Right, Nora? Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, as you can see, the world is moving faster and faster, and visualization is the key technique everyone is using. Uh, having done a lot of uh, data for years, and you have a lot of, collect a lot of information, it's very important what end use is required, mm -hmm. what is the end user requirement, and then you can tell how we can optimize the cost, and what is the end need. If you can connect these two together, some may need only a solid model for viewing, a, a, what do you say, a real estate or you know, mm -hmm. a building information or parcel information, you can go only solid model. But if you want, want to see an animation picture kind of stuff on, on, their, on their models, then go for the LOD3 or LOD4. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can connect to your scope, with reference to the available technologies and available types of LODs, that would definitely can convince your management to uh, really uh, give them a good scope. And well, if you have, uh, yeah, that please. I can I can add on to that from a different perspective. Okay. Uh, if we have a little bit of time. Great. Um, when our first slides, we were talking about a convergence. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the, when we are talking about technology, uh, the way that I look at it is. Um, there's a convergence of uh, industries like engineering, architecture, and GIS. Engineering is used to visualizing 3D in a CAD environment. Architecture, in, now they're using uh, digital BIMs. Mm -hmm. um, and then GIS is more on the, the virtual world. There's a, there's a really convergence of that. So if you're from the engineering side trying to uh, get these 3D models, I would think that it would be, and also from the architectural side, it would be fairly easy to pitch that because everybody visualizes in that and it's just a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're mostly on the user side, like on the government side, um, I would try to showcase it from that, saying these three models really show engineering construction, architectural mm -hmm. drawing from the engineering side, and also uh, viewing it within a GIS. So there's definitely an advantage of showcasing it through that with one simple. So it's 
instead of going to three organizations, a geospatial firm, an engineering firm, and an yeah. architectural firm, you can get it more or less done here as an initial phase. I mean, if it costs you 500 bucks to do one model as a simulated 3D model with textures, mm -hmm. um, it could save you X amount of dollars by not hiring different firms. Okay. And um, on that subject, I had uh, Michael was looking for some clarification on the LOD, the level of detail numbers that were referred to. I know that number one is the least detail and number four is the most detail, but could, uh, could one of you elaborate on that? I can do it really quickly. I can uh, um, talk from a simple point of view. But okay. um, what Prasad was in, in his last slides, um, he was really showcasing all the different level of details. Uh, when you saw the regular uh, apartment residential building, uh, it's a simple four corners on the bottom, four corners mm -hmm. on the top, and then the pitched roof. Um, and, and then you give it a solid on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a level of de uh, detail one. Okay. It's a very simple four points on the bottom, two points to cover the pitched roof. Um, that's the LOD one. Mm -hmm. And LOD two is when you have a more detailed building that uh, on the structures, whether it's on the rooftop, you have some additional, uh, you know, uh, generators and more complex ornate structures uh, for a larger building, and then you have uh, an entryway on the on the on the side on the facade. Those require some detailed roof print texturing. So you okay. it's a very more realistic review of it, but it's in a solid or a wireframe, so there is no image textured onto it. The level of G3 and 4 are very similar in that one is you use synthetic texturing. So if you have, from a satellite image or an aerial image, you have a little bit of a side view and you want a very quick rendering of it, mm -hmm. uh, Google SketchUp does this as well. They have okay. a little base print of images. That's on an old G3 where it's mm -hmm. just synthetic texturing. It's not real images. An LOD4 is associated to a very detailed texturing from either a digital image, from an oblique image, um, from a LiDAR uh, sensor, as well as from inside indoor modeling, where you have either a LiDAR sensor capturing it, where you can actually provide the detail of each of the structure, internal wall units and where everything is located. So those are the four main differences. Okay. I mean, you can also look at an LOD5 could be BIMS where it covers the inside and the outside because it's just that additional level. So mm -hmm. maybe we can add another one uh, for this discussion that would be LOD4 for the structure that an LOD5 would be a full service BIM. Okay. And uh, as, as long as we're on that subject, I had another question that came in from Xiaoping. Which level of detail, one, two, three, or four, is the most popular yeah. one that you're finding people um, acquiring and using? I'll take this one again before everybody else jumps in. Um, <laughs> I think everybody would have a different answer um, mm -hmm. for Earth engines like Google Earth and Apple Maps. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would be uh, a uh, for the more urban cities or urban areas. It would mm -hmm. be an LOD four, okay, uh, uh, and, or an LOD three, depending on some areas that are more remote that don't have uh, the detailed accuracy. Uh, so I would think today's age, you see. Um, uh, an LOD3 and LOD4. For municipalities where 90% of your structures are residential, I would say that it would be um, an LOD1 uh, for a, a larger percentage, but the more detailed ones where more people look at uh, would be the more complex ones. Okay, great. Um, so over to you, Prasad. Um, Elizabeth wanted to know what types of analysis capabilities are available with these models. So beyond visualization, what can you do? Well, I mean, very nice question. I mean, um, it's not about only the models. What, what we have seen so far is a compilation of the kind of data you have. So you might have data, most of, let's say 70% of the data you have it from the geospatial sources. And if you have some uh, BIM models or kind of uh, architectural models, that's 20-30% of the you know, uh, the kind of data. Mm -hmm. So when we look at all this, the analysis types, we have, um, uh, we can do a lot of uh, analysis in terms of um, wind analysis in this. We can do um, a kind of uh, analysis in terms of, let's say, thematic mapping or proximity analysis. I mean, 
most of the GIS uh, kind of capabilities which you can do it here but specifically if you want the shadow analysis the sun path analysis all these kind of things which yes we can do that which is pretty much required uh, for uh, a city uh, level people uh, for the town planning as well as for the township building or the kind of orientation of the buildings the new infrastructure coming in rehabilitation a lot of things which we can address in this so yeah quite a bit of analysis too which mm -hmm. is involved in this yeah okay great um, thanks for that and coming back to um, timing um, Drew, I think this one's going to go to you, but you mentioned um, somebody was wanting to know for the New England project that took nine months, how many 3D hours were needed to complete the project? And I think in general we've had several questions about how long does it really take, and I suppose that part of that is, well, how many people do you want to throw at the problem? But could you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I can't go into the exact number of hours. Um, uh, it's, that's just a uh, confidential agreement with mm -hmm. uh, the municipality. but. The entire nine months was not directed towards doing the 3D modeling. The entire month was from the date of the aerial collection. Um, I would think that uh, uh, maybe at max a month uh, of the nine months was mm -hmm. uh, trying to be more dedicated towards that component. 3D modeling, the models themselves, are more or less a end product. You do need to mm -hmm. do uh, the air collection, do the ground control, do the AT, uh, do the uh, you really do need to set up uh, the the DTM to create the contours um, as well as some planimetric features. So when you start capturing the planimetric features, at that point, then you can start doing some of the three D models. So it's really an end product, uh, an end step to a delivery of a project like that. So um, it, it really does depend. We had several different variations of level of degrees. Um, so I can't give a specific number. Um, I can, if you have time, I can do a more generic approach to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the 3D models and how much it can cost as a, if people are interested. Um, mm -hmm. An LOG one, I'm sure it can differ, but I always say it, it ranges between a dollar and five hundred dollars a model. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. A dollar uh, is more like a LOG one. Mm -hmm. It can take a few minutes to generate. And deliver. If you need it real time, you know you have an image. You need it compiled. We can do it within minutes. But it, what usually a customer wants is they want a large amount. So they want ten thousand done, or uh, a few hundred, or a few thousand done. So we can't provide it back real time. We kind of do them all together and then provide it. So that can be done in a, in a few days uh, or weeks if needed, depending on how quickly you want it. You just need more people and more machines to be able to compile it. So that can be done very very quickly. Um, the LOD uh, 2s and 3s and 4s can vary. Um, I would think on average you're probably looking at a price point around uh, $250, $300 for LOD 4, not including the interior bin. Um, this also has to, you also need to actually take the picture. If you actually want to hire someone to go out and do the actual uh, image capture from the building front or from the oblique imagery, uh, either you need to subscribe to uh, a license uh, from Bing uh, to be able to view the uh, oblique imagery or have a license with uh, a, a firm that uh, capture it themselves. Um, or you go out, uh, like for the firm in New England, you actually go out yourself, you, you use your staff, you mm -hmm. have a regular digital camera, they all work nowadays, and you capture the image, and then you send it uh, to us to capture. Uh, those costs aren't necessarily included uh, any type of price point. So it's more or less on the production and delivery once you get the source data. Uh, it ranges between a dollar and five hundred dollars. And the okay. five hundred dollars of course is something like on the Vegas Strip. Okay. Where it could take you a lot. It can be more, but on average I would think it would be around you know, if you're talking about ten thousand buildings and you want them all textured to an LOD form, it'd probably be in the range of two hundred and fifty bucks at the higher end on average. Mm-hmm. That'd be a chunk of change for that many buildings. Um, Coming over to <laughs> I have some questions, some technical questions for you, Prasad. What would be the polygon count <clears throat> of a 3D model generated with point cloud using Autodesk infrastructure? So polygon count. Uh, excuse me, Autodesk Infraworks. Um, I could. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So um, 
I probably say, I mean, uh, we have not actually tested uh, how much it should hold, but we, I mean, for an uh, example, we have half of uh, San Francisco which has been built, which I could show you, but maybe next time. So. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, if anybody has got an a infra works, um, I mean, if anybody has got any kind of uh, Autodesk technology, you can go to Autodesk 360 and download that model and see that. It's very, very, very dense. So mm -hmm. I cannot say how many polygons, but yes, I can say how many point cloud, uh, I mean, so it's 20 billion, um, uh, you know, the kind of point cloud data which you can store into there. So, that's pretty cool. I mean, for a kind of size which we are looking at, 20 billion, um, you know, points, not bad. So polygon, yes. 20 billion uh, of anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, great. So I have another one for you, kind of along those lines. Um, <clears throat> can we create different LOD models using Autodesk infrastructure? So can you? collect the data but then vary the kind of model that you create oh yes absolutely I mean um, uh, it's it's ap actually stage wise uh, when you look at you get a, a data capture with uh, uh, aerial uh, aerial survey satellite survey or whatever the survey you use mm -hmm. so people get stuck after you know creating a beautiful 3d uh, terrain modeling and that's the third dimension so far it has been used across the world so it's about the surface where you know it's more getting into the 3d environment and you're creating you're creating the 3d cities mm -hmm. so I mean yeah the 3d mesh uh, the kind of uh, FBX data somebody is an animator who is a game uh, you know uh, animator so he has created a lot of uh, uh, you know models which we can bring in so real-time models yeah it, it's it's a kind of a more of convergence so we okay. always have uh, the solutions for each and every step and stages. So it covers most of the LODs. And um, Prasad and Hanu, both of you, could you respond to this one? Um, what's what, what are the better formats for 3D models? The yeah, better format, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Monsinga. It is DirectX uh, is one of the handy 3D format uh, where it can hold uh, building facets and textures close uh, to any dimension of simulation. So it's a dark text format again. Mm -hmm. And uh, along those lines also... Yeah, on the side of... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead, Prasad. Oh, sorry, sorry. So on the side of technology, if we look at it, I mean, um, we are as we believe with the kind of uh, coexisting with the technologies around mm -hmm. us. So. Uh, we have a better exchange of the formats uh, which we have based on the FDO. So we exchange any formats you have. For example, I mean most of the data is in FBX or uh, XML or you know kind of a city XML or city GML or you know types of data uh, data you have. So mm -hmm. it's more of exchanging the data. So since it is an open format uh, kind of uh, technology preview, we, which we typically follow. So we accept most of the, I mean, 99% 99 I would say, uh, we have the, uh, you know, uh, data processing techniques in there. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. The best mod, I mean, still, I, I, I guess I have not answered the question. So <laughs> the, I mean, yeah, so it, it, it's more like, you know, uh, which, which is the best format. I mean, there's nothing best as such so far, but mm -hmm. which holds the uh, large format, uh, large kind of a data, I would say, and it's getting handled e easily. Mm -hmm. Which is based on XML. I think that's the that's the best. Yeah. Okay. And, and also an, that's also mm -hmm. an open source platform, XML. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's been uh, more commonly yeah. accepted and platform uh, accepted. So uh, a lot of open source ones have, uh, even though there are softwares that use specific ones, they it's kind of like the uh, universal language is English. Uh, is that uh, XML mm -hmm. is open source, so a lot of people use it and are open to it. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, um, also wanted to address this one. What other 3D browsers can you use? I think you mentioned Bing and Google. What other 3D browsers? Uh, Bing, uh, Google, yeah. Apple Maps, uh, yeah. uh, the Esri uh, City Engine, uh, 
there are, there are some other like Skyline uh, yeah. Terra Explorer Pro, which okay. has uh, very simple uh, built-in building tools uh, that can take the advantage of, well, especially the building limbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, based on the uh, requirements or based on the specifications, I mean we can uh, alter the browsers here. Okay, great. The Skyline Terra Explorer. All right, I'm Thank going to you. do one more question, then we're going to wrap it up. And since we're since Directions is a GIS, a ge geospatial publication, I want to ask this one. Is it easy to georeference the 3D uh, models that are built? And that, I think, Hanu, you might be good yes, person to answer that's, that. That's, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. It is very easy to georeference these models. And uh, as I explained in my, I think, on the slide, my second slide, uh, georeferencing is something that uh, which goes hand in hand, and yes, uh, yes all the three models can be geo. And I'm going to answer it from uh, the non-technical side of it because Hanu, uh, he, uh, you know, as you can see, he has the doctor in front of his name, and that he thinks everything is easy because he's, he's been doing it for so many years. Uh, you really do need to have the right infrastructure, which is uh, the right equipment, the right software, and mm -hmm. the right resources, the skilled resources to be able to stay easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, you great. You not just cherry-rig it and do it in an Excel spreadsheet. You right. need the software to be able to do it. You need to know someone that's been doing it for several years mm -hmm. uh, that knows what they're doing. Okay. So after that, sure. Yes. Then it's easy. <laughs> great. Well, like, we're going like, to like, like Prasad says, if you buy the ultimate edition or the platinum edition, everything becomes easy. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Well, we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. I just really want to thank our speakers, um, Drew, Hanu, and Prasad. Thank you so much. I want to remind everybody to send Lynette an email if you need a certificate, and I want to also remind everybody about the free data analysis from Infotech, Drew for the Americas, and Hanu for everywhere else. And of course, contact Prasad with your your questions that are specific to Autodesk, and. Um, uh, great job, everybody, and thank you, audience, so much for all those awesome questions. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to all of them, um, but you will be able to contact the speakers. And until next time, this is your moderator, Nora Parker. Thanks for coming, and be sure to uh, tell a friend about Directions Magazine, and bye for now.